Um, our first speaker now is Stephen Kakfui, who is, I'm sorry, I think I gave that a bit of a Maori pronunciation then. Uh, Stephen is here. Yes, thank you. Kia ora, Stephen. Stephen is a, a former Northwest Territories uh, Premier, Dene Nation President. He uh, was born in a traditional Dene camp on Yalta Lake in Northwest Territories, spent his early years on the land. Um, during his term in office, he established the Northwest Territory Dene Cultural Institute, and uh, nationally, he founded the Indigenous Survival International Organization with the assistance of the Assembly of First Nations and other Aboriginal organizations. Stephen also played a major role in organizing Northwest Territory Dene and Métis and participation of Southern support groups in Justice Tom Burgess' landmark inquiry into the Mackenzie Valley Natural Pipeline, which at that time as you'll recall, recommended a moratorium on development. So um, uh, it's an absolute pleasure and honour to have Stephen um, talking to us today. He's been working with Northwest Territories Water Strategy for the last five years. And uh, I'll turn it over to, to you, Stephen. Thanks so much. Good morning. My name is uh, Steve Kakfui. I am um, just came in from Yellowknife last night. I was uh, last year on these grounds, somewhere around 1972, when this was still a, a residence. And um, I had come out of my home community of Fort Good Hope to take uh, courses in education. And in the midst of that, the, uh, the Berger Inquiry was just starting to get underway. The um, Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nations treaty organizations were just starting to um, get organized. In the Northwest Territories, the uh, Indian Brotherhood of the Northwest Territories was just established. And um, at the young age of 23, I left teaching to uh, get into uh, helping at the community level to um, prepare for the Berger Inquiry. And I haven't been back to continue my studies. I've been back to Lister Hall. Uh, so it's a very different landscape from where things were in 1974. I remember looking out the window of uh, Lister Hall. I was truly a starving student. Uh, there was no money. We used to have uh, live on sandwiches. And I thought, you know, someday I'd like to write a book I got as far as the first title, and um, it was about dreams and visions. It's about the dreams of a, a young First Nation citizen. And uh, it wasn't really dreams, I think it was more to do with vision. Today I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my personal experience a little bit about my view about leadership and um, this country we live in, the province where we are right now and uh, where I am um, make my home in the Northwest Territories. Some of the landmarks that are, I think, of significance to me, a little vision clip from the, from the future, of the future, and perhaps indirect some advice and uh, motivation to, to do things. In 1975, a group of us set out a declaration in the Northwest Territories called the Dena Declaration. 
it was the first time that anybody could remember a uh, an indigenous treaty group stepping forward and saying to Canada that we are a nation, a Dene nation, with a right to determine our own future, control our own land, make our own laws, set up our own government. It was groundbreaking. Uh, Canada took a little while to recover from that. They thought it was a, a separatist declaration. They thought the communists had moved in and taken control of us. They thought many things. The very last thing they thought was we actually could of our own free will, with our own consciousness, make that declaration and a statement like that. I mean, it wasn't in the mainstream Canada to think that First Nations people were intelligent, were a people, were uh, ever a self-determining, independent, self-reliant people. And if you look at the history of Canada, and if you could go back to the history books of the time, there was almost absolutely nothing in the history books that said otherwise. That the best you could get was that, oh yeah, they were running through the bushes, chasing buffalo, hunting deer, when we came along. And thank God for us, we came along. That was kind of the attitude of uh, historians and, um, and the authorities in Canada. So when people come along and start to rewrite history and challenge the status quo, it, it, it does unravel uh, the very foundations on which governments and legislatures and self-appointed spokesmen stand on, it, 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 it shakes people. And so that was what happened in 1975, and we were also launched at that time the Berger Inquiry. There was a pipeline proposed to bring Alaskan gas through the northern Yukon, from Prudhoe Bay through the northern Yukon into the McKenzie Delta in the northern part of the Northwest Territories and the pipeline to run right through the McKenzie Valley, the Valley of the Dene. And after they announced it, then the, because there was a minority government, the NDP said, we want an inquiry. And so Tom Berger was appointed to that. As I said, I was 23, 24 at the time. Many of us, including uh, our friend Sam Gargan, who is sitting here with us today, were just starting to uh, take leadership positions in our communities. My father, my grandfather were the traditional leaders in our community. But we came home and were telling my my people and uh, of all the things that we wanted to do, the things we found wrong and things we wanted to do. And I always tell a story about my father saying, tell me again, my son, what is it you're going to do? And I'd, you know, I'd be so happy he'd ask me. And I'd say, well, Dad, we're going to take back a whole bunch of our land. We're going to uh, manage the wildlife. We're going to take over our community. We're going to run the schools. We're going to set up our own government. We want to change the Constitution of Canada. We want to uh, set up management regimes for water and land, environment, and wildlife. And we want to send a member of parliament to Ottawa. And we want to build our own houses, run our own programs. And I say, you really going to do all that, you know, with the biggest smile on his face? And I, who had never had a job up until then, 
I said, yeah, that's, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do, Dad. And they enjoyed to hear that so much. The, uh, the old people asked us to take the leadership, to, to be the voice of the emerging nation. And that's how we went to the Berger Inquiry. The elders went, the traditional leaders went, and young people like myself, who could barely hang on to my speaking notes, went to the Berger Inquiry and spoke. The elders said, we have to get our people together. Every community, we have to ally ourselves with the New Valuit, with the Métis, with Treaty 8, Treaty 11, all the Dene communities. And they recognize a positive upside to the horrible experience of residential school that so many of us went through. I went for seven years to residential school. There's a positive side to it, which we brought home, which is I knew students in every community in Northwest Territories, Somebody, something that my father didn't have, my, my grandfather didn't have, the traditional leaders didn't have. I already had a network. And that was part of the reason they pushed us to the front. They said, we know you guys are going to network. You know each other. We want you guys to be the front line. And I bring that to you today because I think that has been part of the key to our success in many things we've done. Those of you that study political science will know it is the Northwest Territories leadership that played a very significant part in dealing with the patriation and amendments to the Canadian Constitution. That people like John M. Agualik, Eric Taguna, and many of the Inuit leaders in at that, that time part of the Northwest Territories, George Erasmus, many of our leaders were the leaders because we came from a culture that cultivated collective approach, consensus approach to issues. We knew how to reach out. We knew how to develop partnerships. We know how to develop teamwork. And we know how to keep in each other engaged and on side. With that type of a characteristic, that type of leadership, that type of ability, we also tackle division. Division of Northwest Territories. That happened because we could get over the differences we've had historically with Inuit people, traditional enemies. Why? God forbid, we know them all. But that's what we inherited. We got past that. And we said division is something the Inuit want. We think it may be a benefit to us. We support them in their pursuit of becoming a territory onto themselves, setting up their own government, whether it's a public government or whatever, that was their choice. So division happened. It's probably the single longest border ever negotiated in the history of the world without any bloodshed, any war, any conflict. It was negotiated from top to bottom, piece by piece, between our peoples. There were some people that were not happy at the end because they couldn't come to a, a definite final resolution on the exact location of the border. But there are also groups like from Great Bear Lake, the community of Diline, which to this day, every two years, they have exchanges with the Inuit community of Kogluktuk, Copper Mine, where they go visit. They go over there and visit. They trek overland by uh, Skidoo. And every two years, the Inuit come to Great Bear Lake to the Dene community. That's the kind of relationships that are established. Recently, in the Northwest Territories, our people started about 20 years ago. That's recent for me. We started having more and more meetings that focus not so much on Treaty 8 and Treaty 11 anymore, because we 
always end up talking about Treaty 8 and 11 first, and then we deal with the other issues. More recently, we started talking about water by itself. The concerns we have about water and the quality of water, the volume of water, the potential impacts on things like climate change, tar sands, BC dams, pulp mills, uh, transportation, traffic on the, on the rivers, the uh, way that our uh, local water supply is uh, provided to us. We did that for about 15 years, and then our leaders started to say, well, we, we have to do something. We can't just keep talking about it and saying, we're concerned, we're concerned, we're concerned, there's a problem. And so, about five years ago, the Minister of uh, Environment, Mike Miltonberger, who's uh, from Fort Smith, Métis from Fort Smith that I went to school with, he uh, made a proposition. He said, as a minister of the government of those territories, I propose to the First Nations, to the uh, chiefs of Treaty 8 and 11 in Northwest Territories, to the New Valuate and the Métis people, that we engage as partners with the government of Canada to look at developing a strategy on how to deal with water. And I was the, the uh, leader that was asked to go to the chiefs, explain the proposition, and discuss with them the merits of it. And we had long-range discussions, of course, as you know, as soon as we talk about anything, land, water, whatever, people immediately say, well, you know, I have to see if it affects my, my treaty rights. And we, uh, of course, got into that engagement. But at the end of the day, people said, you know, this is a fundamental issue, a fundamental concern that, of course, we're not going to ignore it, but we don't want to be we want to just say, look, yes, we agree. If you want to work on water with me, and you want to work on water with me because I'm concerned about the quality of water, drinking water, then yes, I'll be a partner. So we stayed away from discussing treaty rights, constitutional rights, and just said, this is a fundamental issue of water. Of course, there is uh, treaty rights, Aboriginal rights, uh, indigenous rights, constitutional rights involved here, but we're going to set up a partnership. We don't need to say it. We are nations. We are distinct, self-determining people, and we will take our place with the government of Canada, with the government of Northwest Territories, as full partners and develop a strategy. Thank you. So, about three years ago, we set up a steering committee. Um, Aboriginal steering committee from all the regions, and they together with uh, technicians, officials from the other governments, drafted a, a strategy on how to deal with water, how to manage water, how to plan for, make a plan, a strategy, and how to work together as all partners, communities with the federal government, the different departments, the government of Northwest Territories, to take water as it is, look at how it used to be, how it is now, and plan for recovering the quality and the quantity of water and bringing it back where possible to a pristine state, to a place where people could drink water and not worry about what might be in there. The water strategy that uh, was developed didn't involve consultation. We just engaged the First Nations and said, you want to be a partner, here is uh, the draft strategy that's developed with your input. If you like it, uh, 
tell us what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Uh, the very two, two main points came back from the chiefs. They liked the strategy, but they said two things. We want to be engaged at the community level. So our people are monitoring water and engaged. The second thing is we want action. We want an action plan developed so that we know you're going to do something and we know what it is you're going to do it and we know how you're going to do things. And so the, the water strategy was uh, finalized two years ago and an action plan was developed and the chiefs approved both of them. The legislature approved it and so now we have an NWT water strategy with an action plan. Two, two other things I should tell you, and uh, I'm going to leave. I only have one copy of each of these things I want to talk about. Uh, so I have here uh, one copy of the NWT water stewardship strategy, and I have one copy of a plan for action. There's um, websites for these uh, with the government of Northwest Territories through the Department of Environment and uh, Natural Resources. One of the most significant things that I want to bring your attention to is that in 1997, the government of British Columbia Alberta, Saskatchewan, the government of Yukon and Northwest Territories, five governments. And I'm highlighting Alberta for you because Alberta also signed what they call the McKinsey River Basin Transboundary Waters Master Agreement. 1997, this government, this province signed a master waters agreement. And it basically says something that the language that you couldn't force probably BC and Alberta to sign today. But they signed it then, thank God. It says, whereas the waters of the McKinsey River Basin should be managed to preserve the ecological integrity of the aquatic ecosystem and to facilitate reasonable, equitable, and sustainable use of this resource for present and future generations. And whereas cooperative management of the waters of the McKinsey River Basin requires the application of consistent guiding principles. And it goes on in a language that I'm sure they uh, woefully look back and wonder what ever made them sign such a document. Because this is the kind of thing that you could hold people's feet to the fire for. The tar sands, the pulp mills, uh, the impact of climate change, and the, uh, the dams and proposed dams in BC are going to have and are having an impact on the McKinsey River Basin. The peace, the Athabasca, the quality of water and the volume of water is being impacted as we speak. And all of us that signed this agreement have said, irregardless of boundaries, whether it's BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, all of us are committed to preserving the well-being and the health of this entire basin. Not just the arms, the legs, or the toes, the whole thing. Everything that flows and is part of this ecological ecosystem. I think that is something that all of you should look at if you are part of the leadership that is going to uh, try to do something about the, the way in which industry and governments often uh, cohort to uh, use and abuse 
the water and the land and the ecosystems like the McKinsey uh, Basin. Part of what was agreed to was also that there will be transboundary water negotiations. So it, in a way, it gets better. You know, not only did we sign an agreement, we said we're going to negotiate transboundary water uh, agreements. So today, we are on the verge of beginning formal negotiations with the province of Alberta, with the government of Alberta. Government Northwest Territories is beginning and getting ready to begin negotiations in the next month or so with the government of Alberta, transboundary water negotiations. How the waters that form the McKinsey Basin go from Alberta into the Northwest Territories to address the concerns we have about how that water is treated and respected and taken care of. So it's not like nothing is happening. There is a, a lot happening. Um, it's not for me to say more about the transboundary water negotiations. Um, so I'm not going to tell you any more than that. But I could tell you that in my view, what I have to do is go across Canada and take every speaking opportunity that is extended to me and even those that aren't to see a microphone, a conference, uh, a media opportunity to speak ab about water and the fundamental importance it has for now and for our future and why we have to take care of it. That's my job. And I think I always talk about the movie, Other People's Money. My little friend, Danny DeVito, he wakes up every morning, he rolls over, and then he turns his laptop on, and he checks and sees how his investment and his play with other people's money is doing. I say we have to develop a culture where we're not only checking our little bank accounts every day and the weather, we should wake up every morning and know exactly how our governments, our municipalities, our industries are taking care of our water. And if there's a river beside us that nobody's been able to swim in for 20 years, we should be able to tell our children, we have a plan that in 20 years, you will be able to go back to swim in that, that river. That in 30 years, you will be able to go back there and drink from that water. That's what we need, and that's what we're striving for in the Northwest Territories. And we hope it will catch on across the country. There's no reason why the Great Lakes should be a place where swimming and drinking water from is banned. The Clare River, people should know where their water comes from. In the Northwest Territories, I was appalled to know a little community like Kakiza with 80 people living beside Kakiza Lake, Kakiza River running right here, they get their water trucked in from another community an hour away, twice a week. And no one has been able to tell them why they can't drink from that lake or that river. But they're told, don't do it. That for a number of years now, we don't drink from our rivers and our lakes. 20 years ago, you wouldn't see a bottled water in our meetings. Now, they're everywhere. Four years ago, when I started the water strategy meeting, on the McKinsey Highway, Fort Providence, where Sam's from, gasoline was cheaper than a bottle of water. A liter of, of gasoline was cheaper than a liter of water in Fort Providence. The absurdity of 
I think our, our situation was astounding to us. And that's the information we're sharing. People are finding out where we get our water from, how it's treated or not treated, you know, whether we have reservoirs or holding tanks, uh, filtration systems. People want to know. And so we've been giving them information. And it's empowering because people in Atlavik know what the Chippewan and the Cree and Fort Smith are doing about their water. Partnering. They're partnering. They're studying. This year, we set up monitoring systems along the rivers, along the Slave River, places like Fort Smith, just north of Fort Chippewan partnering with Fort Resolution further down the river to partner on monitoring the water, testing the water. And further down the McKinsey River, there's different places. Our communities are working on that. The results will be coming back, will bring back to the communities. Aside from treaty rights and water rights, there's ongoing issues. And one of the things that I thought was an incredible strength that we brought to the national uh, stage back in the 80s was our ability to get beyond thinking only treaty rights and get beyond what can we do. That was what made a difference in getting uh, to have a strong working relationship with the Métis and the Inuit in changing the Constitution, in making division happen. Today, I see some of our communities going back to working as little communities, working as regions, and not cultivating that part of our culture, which is said, you should be concerned for the Gwich'in in the north and the New Valley. You should be concerned for the Akecho and the that Cho, that none of us should make major decisions until all our relations, all our relatives, all our allies are on side. Sometimes we lose that, and when we lose that, we lose in a big way. I say that because I know uh, First Nations are all part of different organizations we can stand on our treaty rights until there's absolutely nothing left. We have to cultivate that part of leadership that gets things done, that develops the vision, the action plan, and executes it. And get beyond being protectionist, being isolated, saying, you know, as treaty people, we don't deal with Métis, we don't deal with urban Indians, we don't deal with the Inuit. We're in a fight for our lives, for our existence. We need allies. We need other governments. We need the Canadian public to be on side with us. There are people willing to help. They just need to be told what it is we want done, how we want it done, and how to work with us. The gift is there. I think we feel like David so many times, uh, Goliath, there's two of them. Eh? There's sometimes we say the Alberta government and industry, two Goliaths, you know, staring down the barrel at piddly little First Nations, talking about treaty rights and water rights. But I believe we could beat them not in the sense of making them submit to anything, but to let us take our place as nations, as a strong people, a people with vision, a people who have a right to be part of Canada, to be a part of Alberta, to be at the table when things are being discussed, when things are being um, shared, anything from jobs to contracts, that we need to be there, and we should be there. And that is the culture that I come from. 
It's wavering sometimes, but it's there. That for me, a pipeline is of no use. It was no use in 1975 because my chief didn't even have a bank account. No telephone, no office, no staff, absolutely nothing. 95% of us were still trapping. Even if they gave us a $100 million contract, we wouldn't even know what to do with it. That we didn't have the capability. Today, we do need jobs. We do need contracts. We need some way to handle revenue that could flow to us. And we could handle that. But there has to be something for everybody. It cannot be just for the oil and gas industry. It cannot be just for the government of Alberta. There has to be something in there for the First Nations. And I would be the first to sign on many things if they could say, and yes, we can tell you in definite terms how your community is going to change because of us. When the diamond mines came, we had some tough leaders. Our premier at that time said, if BHP wants to open a diamond mine, it had better tell us in very definite terms what it's willing to provide. Otherwise, it'll stay in the ground. And so we were strong, we were collective. And BHP at the end said, OK, we will concede to many of your demands. Today, we have a certain percentage of Aboriginal and Northern people that are guaranteed jobs, employment at those mines. A percentage of the construction capital expenditure was guaranteed to Northern and Aboriginal businesses. The annual operating capital and expenditure that's made by these mines has to go to Northern and Aboriginal businesses. We did that because we said, if there's nothing in it for us, leave it in the ground. No one has ever done that to an oil and gas company. Sometimes you think they practically own the government of Alberta, because I can't tell the difference when they talk. In the Northwest Territories, I can tell my leaders, I don't need you to tell me what Enbridge wants you to say. Enbridge is already talking for themselves. I don't need you to tell me what the mining companies want you to say. I want to know that my government is representing me. It's representing the little communities, the disabled, the women, the children, the unemployed, the homeless. And how are they going to provide a benefit? And how are you going to measure it? If Fort Good Hope, my home community, is not going to have paved roads, recreational facilities, good adequate housing for everybody, social programs, because of the hundreds of millions of dollars of oil and gas exploration in the next 20 years, then why do it? Why do it? So that's my uh, discussion with you today. I don't think that personally I have any great gifts. I have been privileged to serve as the president of the Dene Nation. I've worked with the Assembly of First Nations on many issues. I've also had the distinct record of being also uh, in the legislature of Northwest Territories and the public government as a uh, minister for 12 years, and then the last four, total of 16, as a premier. So I've served as an Aboriginal uh, First Nations leader. And also, I've represented uh, Métis, non-treaty Dene, and treaty Dene. And I've served as a premier, serving the public interest and the interests of First Nations for four years. So I have the distinct the distinction of, of having served both Aboriginal governments, Aboriginal nations, and public government. So I've worked with many, many leaders, prime ministers, uh, premiers across this country. 
And um, there's vision, there's lack of vision. Leadership, there's people that come forward and say, if you elect me, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And then there's leaders that say, here's what I believe in. Here's what I see. If you could see what I see, and if you like the things I want, then vote for me. And that's the kind of leadership we need to cultivate. Leaders that can reach out and get beyond their differences, beyond their regional borders, and provide something for everybody. Thank you very much. Merci.